What's up, guys? Still got some people coming in, I see. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dustin Wadden. I am one of the liberals for Team USA. Um, I went to Long Beach State, and uh, it's been 10 years now since I've been a professional. Played in uh, Brazil. Last year, I played in Germany. Won a title of BR Volleys. Uh, before that, grinding my way through Finnish League. I played a year in the French Second League, Brazil, France, France A. And then uh, I played three years in Poland. And Poland is, uh, I just wrote a post on this. I'm doing a little takeover today. Poland is really unique. It's actually, um, I think, maybe the only country in the world where volleyball is the most popular sport. So it's really cool. Um, especially because when I was young, I had no idea you could play pro. Because when I was young, I was a terrible player. Um, I got started really late, maybe like some of you. I got started when I was uh, in high school. Um, and I just got so lucky because my dad was a teacher at my high school. And the coach needed a freshman coach. And I uh, asked my dad if uh, I wanted to play. And my answer was, like it always was, uh, no, I don't want to play volleyball. It's a girls sport. <laughs> I'd always played soccer. And then uh, I just got lucky. I heard a couple of my friends from the soccer team were going to play for volleyball. And I went back to my dad and said, you know what, maybe I'll play volleyball. And so I got to a pretty uh, tough start. Uh, the first two teams I played on were B teams. So the first set team I was on was a 16-2 team. Next year, the same thing, 16-2 team. And uh, the first uh, JOs I went to, um, back when I played, it was an open and a club division. And so... We were in the club division and we got dead last. And I remember it very uh, detailed because we lost to a team from Maryland. And I remember thinking, man, lost to a team from Maryland. We suck. <laughs> but you know what? It was uh, probably the best foundation for me because after that, I realized the only place for me to go was up. And I realized I really loved the sport of volleyball and I just wanted to get better. And so after that, pretty much every day, in the summer, I wake up. Luckily, my dad was a teacher. We drive down to the beach, lose to a bunch of old guys, come back to my house, taught my younger brother, who was ten at the time, how to pepper. Just peppered all day till he got tired and hit the ball off the wall. And then once it got dark, I come inside and I drew a bullseye on my wall, set myself, set the bullseye, and I was just always so curious and passionate to be a little bit better each day. So even though eventually in college I was all American, still it never really got easy for me. My first year I didn't have a contract. And even after that, I went to Finland and barely played for $1,000 a month. But you know what? I was just so lucky because the, the joy for volleyball was inside here. I didn't need the money or the fame or the contracts. I just always wanted to keep on playing. And this passion really grew into me seeking out different edges. One of them today is video, right? So I watch a lot of video, especially overseas, 30 minutes to an hour a day. I try to watch really good liberos, and not just liberos, sometimes I'll watch good outsides too. And just be really curious and see what they're doing, why they're doing it. If they're able to do things consistently at a really high level, maybe I should look into trying that, right? You can always be learning. I'm 33 and I still think I'm learning so much. I just wrote a, a passing course, uh, like a free day passing course. I'll tell you more about that later. But uh, in writing this, I had to watch a lot of film. I just started learning so many different things. Oh, that player is so good. Why is he doing that? He's doing it consistently. Maybe I should try that. You know, because at the same time, just because I grew up in California doesn't mean I have all the volleyball knowledge in the world, right? And so learning from different players coming from different parts of the world, I just become stronger and more confident and clear on what I want to do. And in writing this, um, in this passing course, I passed the best of my life. And so there's a lot of power watching film. And so it's going to be an exciting session. We're going to watch film on, uh, in my opinion, two of the best passers in the world, uh, libero for the USA team, Eric Shoji. And then uh, outside hitter, Taylor Sanders. You might know both names. Uh, so we're going to watch them, see what they do, and uh, talk a lot about preparation, footwork, 
uh, and contact. And then most importantly, um, how we're able to create space between our arms and our bodies. Because there's a lot of times where we shank balls and we didn't want to shank the ball, right? So what can we learn from that? And what can we learn from the best players in the world? Because we're learning from the best players of the world where they have to make quick decisions, quick reactions. We have a lot more time. We're going to be a lot more clear, a lot more confident, and we're going to pass a lot better. So excited to have you guys. Uh, I know we got a lot of people from the Midwest, and I love it. There's two guys that are my favorite teammates in the USA, Scotty Tuzinski, who also went to Long Beach, and uh, Rufy Troy. So two amazing guys, and I know there's a couple of you out there, if not all of you, that have a great future ahead of you. So let's keep going. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but throughout the conference, there is a, a chat and a Q&A, and you guys can hit that up at any time. Ask me questions. I want to make sure you guys really absorb as much as possible, right? If we're going to do this. Let's do it as best as we can. So anytime, write a question. You can write down on a piece of paper. You can ask it after, but you can ask it uh, anonymous, anonymously. And so no pressure on what the question is. You know, you could be worried about being embarrassed. You can ask whatever question about what we're watching or maybe about my journey, how I got to college, as a life as a pro, or maybe something defensive. So um, let's do this. Let's share the screen. And then, yeah, we're going to watch Eric and Taylor. And so when I like to watch a video, if I can, I want to watch playoff volleyball, right? I want to watch it when everything's on the money where people have to be as great as they need to be physically, even mentally training for so long, excuse me. And they're just ready to kill it. So we're going to watch first Eric Shoji. You see him in the blue. So Eric is one that I wouldn't say one of Eric is the best passer in the world. And there's no one that even comes close. I watch video on everyone. And no one can pass like Eric. And so we're going to break down what he does. Stop, bro. We're going to start by watching his feet. So this is what we call a split step. If you play tennis, you know this really well. It's what you do to, to gather yourself and put yourself in an athletic and balanced position to move laterally, whether it's a serve or on counterattack. Because most of the time, we're not flat-footed, right? We're going to do a hop, whether it's conscious or subconsciously. But there's a lot of power in crafting our split step because there's a couple ways we can do it. And we want to make sure the way that we choose to do it, we're as athletic and balanced as possible. So we can react left, right, forward, and back as easy as possible. So we'll swatch Eric. Boom. See that? So... Most guys widen a lot. You're going to see he's so simple and just barely widens. So that's the first thing. Look how balanced he is. Balanced, able to react. Watch a couple more. Let me turn my email off. I thought I got that. See how simple that is? I love it. Again, so simple. Just a little step. And so what you'll see, we're going to look on a lot of things, but you want to focus on the feet. What happens is it's not necessarily you land and then push. Say the ball is going to be over here. As you're coming down, you're going to push the right foot down first, and then you push off. So you can see Eric does this. And you see he has a negative step, but everyone naturally has a negative step but how quick he is to be able to get out there and get the ball. Boom. So you see, watch his feet, slow. There's the hop right as it's contacted. Set, athletic, balance, can go wherever he wants. See one more time. Big serve. And you can see his left foot never hits the ground. The right foot goes first, and then he immediately pushes out gets a little step because he's passing and gets a great server. So a lot of times at this level, we don't have time to get step. Maybe it's just our knee opens up a little bit. But there's a lot we can learn on a split step. 
uh, after this or maybe before right now I can type you type in for you guys uh, I'll type it after uh, I talk about this I, I wrote this uh, I guess you call it like a manifesto because uh, it's a little my philosophy but also what different styles other people are using and so it's a seven day free passing course you just have to log in the email and then once you do that you'll get an email each day for a week talking about passing and so when we talk about the split step there's a couple of different ways there's Eric's where he's just balanced and he just steps out and then there's an approach split step which I use which I'll walk in left right split and then there's another one uh, that's becoming really popular in Poland with players that I actually think I'm going to start trying next year or it's a one footed split step. So you just step in with one foot, maybe the right, you step in and then you split. And then, you know what, if you don't want to split step at all, because you know, there are great players in the world that have every different style and are still great passers. There's not just one way to pass great. Um, you can just stand normal. And so there's a player from Brazil, Mauricio, who does this. But in the passing course, we talk about all four. And I think the best thing about becoming a better passer is you being a creator, a co-creator in how you want to play the game, right? I can give you the information. Uh, I don't want to speak for your coach because maybe the coach says just this and do that. But I want to give you as much information as you can as many different players who are doing each said skill. And I want you to see what resonates best with you. Do I want to split step? Do I want to split step? Do I not want to split step at all? And I want you to figure out uh, how you're gonna play the game. Because when you do this, now you're gonna buy in much more to a growth mindset where you're always curious about learning rather than it being a black and white. I pass good, I'm, ba I'm good. I pass bad, I'm bad. Because when you bind to the growth mindset, you're always learning. And it's not necessarily, I passed well, so I'm good. I passed bad, so I'm bad. It's, I'm always learning, just learning, just learning, 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 always learning. So the second thing we're gonna look at with Eric is how he starts with his arms. So there's a couple ways he does this, or Eric does this, where he kind of just hangs down. You can see this with Taylor two in area one, where the arms are just kind of hanging straight down. and. Again, we talk about this in the, in the passing course. I like three different ways, or I've seen three different ways. Like Eric, we're hanging down, where naturally our arms are a little more straight, and so all we have to do is reach out towards the ball and connect our arms, right? Because our arms are kind of naturally straight. Aaron, number two, you see in area five, he has the one that I like to use, uh, where my arms are out. I like my arms to be a little bit more out. So his, his is bent. But I like my arms being out a little bit more because as we'll talk later, having space is a big deal between our body because when we pass the ball, there's going to be a blowback. Not every time we can push into the ball. Sometimes, especially with jump serves, our arms are going to come back into our body. And so we want to create as much space as we can before the contact, knowing that we're going to have blowback and our arms are going to come to our body. And if it hits our body, now our hips are going to open up and our initial angle won't be good. And then there's a couple other players, uh, Zatorski from Poland and uh, Genia from France, two of the best liberos in the world, that start really wide. And I can talk about that later. But we'll watch with Eric right now, how his arms are that more straight. I like this because he's really relaxed and all he has to do is get a good read on the ball and then use his shoulders to go get the ball outside of his body. So watch how simple it is. Again, it's... This is Russia, some of the best passers in the world. So balanced. See how his arms are just so simple? And this is something we talk about too. This is, the, this is the question that made me create this course because people always ask me, I want to be a better passer. What can I do? What's a drill? And the thing I'd always reply with is individual arms. And what I mean by this is we pass better when our hips are facing the server and we can adjust our angle or our hips face the center. But when our hips go away from the server or from the target, it's because we connect our arms and then reach outside of our body. And it's natural because when we're first taught to play volleyball, what happens is your coach or your dad or your mom, they don't toss the ball to your left side. They don't toss the ball to your right side. They toss it 
right to you. And what you do is you put your arms together, and then you push forward. But here's the thing. You've had hundreds, if not thousands of repetitions of doing this. Arms together, push. But what happens is the game is it's not going to be someone tossing the ball to you, right? A lot of times it's going to be in the seams. And so what we naturally still do is our arms gravitate to our midline here. But if the ball is outside, now we're chasing it. And what happens is our hips chase as well. So now my target went from being here, my hips opening up to being here. It's really interesting, and it's something I've learned a lot by watching myself. So look how good not only Eric is, but Taylor and Ron, just being very disciplined and very patient with their arms, not connecting. And you can see, even though Eric's arms do connect, they're outside of his body. And so by moving with individual arms, by them not being connected, we're quicker and we're able to keep our hips towards the server. So we can focus on this too, watching Eric, how long it takes for him to connect his arms and how patient he is. And by being patient, he's able to be quicker. And by being quicker, he's able to keep his angle to the target. It's a nice job by Eric. Something you always notice too is he does such a great job holding his platform. Even when he's diving, you can see he holds it. And I was asked this the other day, you know, we were watching Sergio, a great player from Brazil, who breaks his platform a lot. And the question was like, do I need to hold my platform? And no, you don't. But if you hold your platform, you're solidifying your angle. When you hold your platform, you know with complete certainty that's where the ball is going to go. You don't leave it up to chance at all. It's like throwing a ball against the wall. When you throw the ball against the wall, the wall is not going to break, right? It's a strong angle, so the ball will do what it's supposed to do every time and obey physics. If you hold your platform every time, it will do exactly what it does when it hits the wall. So as much as we can, we want to hold the platform. And it's really difficult, especially at this level, but you'll see Eric still does it, and that's why he's the best passer in the world, in my opinion. Patient. Oops. Still a nice pass, though. You can see here, you know, this isn't necessarily <laughs> – the technique, uh, technique that's taught, but the big thing is when we're passing with the emphasis on the angle, it really doesn't matter what our lower body and our upper body is doing. Of course, if we're like this, standing straight up, the percentage of us putting the ball on the target will drastically decrease, but at the end of the day, the ball only knows what angle you give it. It doesn't matter what your feet are doing, what your legs are doing, even what your upper body is doing. But if we are balanced in an athletic position and we're shuffling, not having our head go up and down, we're going to be much more consistent in putting the ball where we want to. Really nice. So a lot of players in area one, we naturally hop into the court. It's something I do, and I've been working on it for so long. I really cannot control it. It's just ingrained into me, especially when it's a service from area one. So if you're like Eric in balance, that's amazing. But if you catch yourself hopping into one, and I really recommend, uh, I'm sure you guys have it now, uh, if you have video of yourself, watch yourself. See what you're doing because a lot of times you're not consciously doing what you think you are. And so if you do naturally hop in, start just a little bit closer to the sideline. And so when you hop in, you're still in your starting place. But Eric does a good job with the split step. Like I said, balanced, shifts his weight on the left side of his body, is able to use that to push. And that's one thing, too, I see a lot of players and also myself, where they're lifting up the right foot and then moving that, where the emphasis and shift of power needs to be on the opposite side. So if the ball's to the right, we need to use our left foot and push. Use the floor always. Use the floor for power where you're going laterally or where you're going up. So it does a great job around this. You just have to be so quick when the balls are to your side. You have to be so quick with the opposite shoulder because if the ball gets behind us, now again, our hips are opened up. But if we be quick with our opposite shoulder, we're able to keep our hips because we're able to get the ball outside in front of us. And that's the most important thing with passing is, again, getting the ball in front of our body. Nice job by Eric. You can see 
ball makes a really good flow. Adjust and outstretch and in a tough position. But once again, he does such a good job keeping the angle. Look at the hold. And so it's when I was a when I was a kid and people tell me to hold the angle, I say, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. But you know, there's so much value to it. When you see the best passer in the world doing it, I think it should resonate with you in that the best player in the world is doing something on a certain skill that I want to improve. Maybe I should try it too. And it's the best way to coach yourself. Because when you're with your coach, maybe it's not necessarily a private, maybe you're with a, a group or maybe you're with your team. You know, the coach can't coach you 100% of the time. They're doing the best he can, but maybe he has 12, 14 other athletes. And so this is the best way to coach yourself because when you hold your platform every time, you'll realize what happens. So here's the ball, shank the ball over there. If you just blow up, you're like, oh, what happened? I coached, you didn't see? No, okay. But if you hold your platform, you're like, well, I was facing over there. I think that makes sense why I passed it over there. And then from there, you can kind of go back and see what happened. Okay, maybe my hips opened up, so that's there. What can I do to keep my hips open? And now you become your own coach. And I think there's a lot of value in that where you don't have to wait for someone to tell you what you're doing wrong. You can kind of dissect it yourself. And each rep you can get a little more out of. So let's watch the split step a little bit more. You can see Taylor, how he steps into it. So this is the second kind of split step we like to talk about. One, two, three. And naturally, what will happen is people will step out a little bit wider. So this is another good thing to get on film, especially a lot of you, a lot of you guys and girls are passing float serves. So we don't want to be really wide, right? If we're really wide, it's gonna be much more difficult for us to move and to be quick. So we're watching video and Consciously, we think we're in an athletic spot, but when we split step, now we're a little wider. Subconsciously, we don't know why we're moving so slow. Watch video. So something that I've done to kind of combat this is when I step into my split step, I will be a foot narrower than I want to be when I'm receiving the ball. So knowing I'm gonna be a little bit wider, I don't wanna start normal. I wanna start a little shallower, boom, boom, split. So another good thing to watch on film for you. Um, let's see how Reed does as well. So Reed does the fir fourth option. If you look at area five, he just doesn't move at all. Just so balanced. And then you can see Matt. He kind of does the second option, stepping into it, and then goes out just a little bit. So Eric, split step, boom. Shifts his weight to the right. And he's quick with his left inside shoulder. And then what he does is a way to create space. You can see at the end, he doesn't really escape his body, even though he tries to. See how the arms come back and hit his body? So it kind of uh, impedes the initial angle, but what he tries to do, and usually he's great at this, is uh, try to sacrifice his body. So by throwing his body back, he creates an extra space and is able to keep his angle out longer. So we'll talk a couple ways of how to create space. I like this for liberos out there. If you have an opposite and it's a big jump server, bring your opposite in. Because most of the time he's not gonna hit the line. And now you and the three main receivers are able to take the middle of the court where the hardest serve is gonna come. So this is another way to create space. Ball comes high on Eric. And he leans back and follows with his steps. So this is something that's taught more in girls volleyball and there's a lot of value to it. I don't know why it's not taught so much in boys. But again, creating that space, knowing there's going to be a blowback. So on contact, the arms come back. And again, if it hits our body, something's going to have to give. And what gives is our hips. And that will change our angle. So it hits our arms, and it comes back to our body, and we step back, just like Eric does. And he's able to stay balanced and go back in cover. Another good job of this uh, sacrifice. And so, you know, this ball floats a lot. So it moves on the last second. 
and he's able to throw his body behind to give him some space to push into the ball. Because a lot of times for jump serves, the angle's enough, right? Or even on a spin serve, the angle's enough. We can just leave it out there and maybe have strong legs and that would be the biggest foundation to put the ball on the spot. But on a float serve or a ball that's a little in front of us, we are gonna have to manufacture some force putting back into the ball. So we're waiting and we're gonna push a little bit. And when we push, we wanna have as least amount of moving parts as possible. So our wrists are locked in, our elbows are locked in. We just wanna push with our shoulders. There's gonna be times where maybe the ball's behind us and if it's just the angle, the ball's gonna go that way and we're gonna have to use what I call talent. Shoulders, elbows, wrists, maybe our hips to put the ball back. You know, this is an emergency move. We don't want to use this because it's really difficult to reciprocate it uh, consistently. And so when we do push, we want to be able to keep the ball in front of us, have good vision. And if we do push, it's going to be initiated with our shoulders. Boom. So again, Eric, how we set up, see how his arms are so straight. And he's really emphasizing his arms outside of his body. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And it gets low. And this is another way we talk about in the, the seven-day free passing course. The seventh day, we speak about um, creating space in all the different ways. And I use two Polish albaros to uh, show this point. But how we can use in between our legs to create space, it's really kind of fascinating. I don't know why I don't use this. I think I'm pretty flexible, but I really don't use this very often. So you can see he gets his hips super low and the ball is in his midline. And so what happens is, you know, you have this space in between your legs where again, the ball can blow back a little bit and there's not going to be anything that hits it. So Eric does a nice job. Once again, using his legs to create space and just holds it and falls back. And the whole time he holds his platform, it's amazing. Just such a technical player. Another one. See how he opens up his leg? This is another way. Because if our leg is just here, our angle is going to hit it. But he opens it up a little bit more and just gives himself a couple more extra inches. So this is a good way on big jump serves or floats that go low. You know, your, your angle is going to hit your knee and then splice open. But he opens his knee up just a little bit to create a little more space. Holds his platform and just gently falls back. So on this one, you can see he has a good track on it and unexpectedly it comes up high. And what happens is his angle hits his body and the ball just pulls off a little off the net. Still a great pass, but you can see it just wasn't exactly where his initial angle wanted it to go. And this is gonna happen when the body gets in the way of the platform. So amazing job. Eric takes the ball not only outside of him, but in front of him. And you can see how much space is in between his arms and his body. There's nothing that's going to hit the blowback. And it's a float, so he's able to push a little bit. Holds the angle so he knows with complete certainty where the ball is going to go. Like I said, like a wall, you throw a ball against the wall, the physics, it won't lie. It will come straight back to you. It's the same when you hold your platform. And we can pass perfectly if we break our platform, but consistently we probably won't be able to, to reproduce the same effects. And then again, once you hold your platform, you can be your own coach as well. And learn quicker, which is the most important thing. If you want to continue to grow, make the next team, make varsity, go D1, go pro, we want to learn as, quick, as quickly as we can, right? We want to get the most out of each rep. Great job by Eric. Watch how he steps back. One, two, three. And he uses his legs as well. Watch how the blowback from his arms are outside his body. Now it comes under his legs. So a little sneaky way to create space. The ball is in your midline. You can use your legs to let the platform go under. Nice job by Eric. Pushes off. Then again, you can see the blowback, but it's fine because he steps back in correlation of his arms being pushed back into his body. He steps back. I like this. This is my favorite way to create space. Tough ball. 
So I like to keep every ball, when I'm in one, just on the left side of my body. So if the ball floats up, I can open up my hip to create that space. But if the ball is on the midline and it floats up, now I have to jump, right? And now I have to do something weird with my angle. But most of the time, my angle is changing. It goes from here to here. But on my left side of my body, if it's high, still keep the same angle, right? And if the ball goes really high, I can open up my hips and I can open up my leg. So I'll lift up my leg and then I can go up. So you can kind of see a little bit of that here with Eric, how he opens the last second. Amazing. Ball's really high, jumps up, and he's able to kind of throw his legs behind, creating that space, the arms to the side. And again, on float, this is my favorite way to receive floats in area one. So just keeping it a little bit on the left side of your body. So see how it starts on his right, he moves, 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 and see how he opens his hip and picks up his leg. So having that ability to open up, it's really good to have some hip flexibility, to be able to be here, open up and keep the angle. Holds the platform, one, two, three, holds the platform, perfect. Now it's where it's gonna go. Again, to, you know, arguably easy serve, but you know, he makes it perfect. Focus on the technique, hold it, perfect. And then bronze medal point, does a good job tracking the ball, moving his feet, keeps the space, hold the platform. And then I'll let you guys watch this play out because I just watched this for the first time today. Wait for it. Who do you set? I think you got to set Matt. Good decision. All right, let's watch a little Taylor for your outsides out there. So Taylor is, uh, <laughs> I mean, second to Eric, I think one of the best passers in the world, even when compared to a lot of liberos. Sometimes when I watch him pass, I'm like, I don't understand. My only job is to pass, and he has passing, serving, blocking, hitting, and he passes better than me. <laughs> so there's a lot I can learn from him. But look at this, just how simple it is. Wait, wait, wait. Little hold. Boom, go. It's a great job getting the angle out. This is a tough part because in area one, the ball gets behind you. Now you have to use your hips and your elbows to throw it back. But look how quick he is getting his arms outside of his body. Lunges, but he has the angle. Ball will always listen to the angle. So nice job. Ball's in midline, floats at the last second. Just a little adjustment with the shoulders. Here, 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 here. We want to be as simple and as quiet as possible for our adjustments. And we want those adjustments to come from our shoulders. And so our platform can stay the same. Nice job. And just look, so simple. Watch the split step. Widens a little bit. But on the split step, he's able to see right away the ball's on his left side. So his right foot goes down first and pushes off. And then always the ball's in front of him. Ball is in front. Quick shoulders. Quick shoulders outside, establish the angle. And he doesn't have to do anything else, just establishing a good angle. The ball will listen to it. Again, wait too long for his arms to connect. We want to wait as long as we can. There's a lot of power in individual arms. Aggressive. And then we talk about this uh, in the seven day course. Uh, for those that know Sergio, Sergio is a player that I've watched a lot about and tried to mold my game after him, this Brazilian libero. And so day three, sorry, day four, five, and six, we talk all about footwork and movement and how we can, in my term, time travel. Because all we're trying to do is to steal time from the moment the server contacts it to the moment when we contact it. And there's even some times where we can kind of uh, take some time before the service, um, but I won't get into that right now. But you can see, 
Taylor does a great job. The ball floats at the last second. Look at that float. And he's initially in a lunge. But he does a really good job sliding his left foot. So we talk about this on day six. Sliding your left foot. Always, if you're lunged out, the benefits of sliding your opposite foot, making sure that you're as rebalanced as possible. So at the last second, and there's a flow or movement, or it's off the tape, we're in a position and power to adjust. Nice job by Taylor. You can see on flow, even though there is some blowback. So again, we always want to have that space between our body. And we can do that in our ability to prepare and choose one of three different ways to start for arms. Nice job, Te. See how his hips open up just a little bit on the high ball. Watch the individual arms. Look at Reed. Reed's so disciplined, his arms don't connect. And when Taylor's connect, because you know, naturally they will connect around our midline, it's on the right side of his body. And so where he connects his arms, it's only a slight movement to get to the ball. The more we have to move with our arms connect, the slower we're going to be, and the more likely our hips are going to open up away from our target. Patient, patient, patient. Outside of his body, in front of his body. These are the big keys. Always in front of your body, and if you can, outside of your body. Because now we don't have to deal with our chest. If the ball moves, if the ball rises, if the ball floats, if we're outside here, and adjust much more easy going behind us. Again, just a slight move with the hips. Throws his body back, creates the space. This ball gets away. You can see how he arms break. So it's easy saying it, watching it, because uh, I struggle at times too with float serves. But I think the correction, if there's any, is just trying to be a little quicker in wrapping the shoulder around. So we can push that with the right shoulder coming in, with the left shoulder wrapping around. But it's much easier to say watching video than it is to do it. But being quicker with the shoulders, waiting as long as we can to adjust. So I get this question a lot. Uh, my hands, how do I pass with my hands? And the big thing when passing with your hands is you don't want to focus passing with your hands. You want to do all the work with your lower body. Um, for those that have ex already started Olympic weightlifting, it should be like a hang clean. How we press off the ground. We use the ground for power. That's where we get the power. If, uh, if someone were to serve you a ball and you're just sitting on your knees and you try to pass it with your hands, you can't do anything, right? It's just your shoulders. It's like, ugh. And even with that, you're trying to press so hard with your shoulders. That now there's so many moving parts with our elbows, with our shoulders, and with our wrists. So what I suggest is, one, we have to be strong with our legs. We have to be strong. We have to move with the athletic legs. We don't want to lose our legs early. We don't want to be straight leg when we pass the ball. We want to be moving like in a, we're in a quarter squat. And then when we do pass the ball, we want to try and be – as centered as we can with the ball, and then move our elbows in. And what we're doing with our arms, our arms is backstop and then guiding. So our backstop, like I said, if we're wide here, there's too many moving parts here, our elbows and our shoulders. But if we come in here, it's just back, right? It's just back. So we absorb it with our legs, and then we push with our legs. So watch Taylor here. He does a really good job. See, so he kind of coils with his legs. And he's starting to use the ground to push, 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 push. Still not extended. Boom. Amazing, right? So he wasn't even extended the whole time. But look at all the strength he gathers from his legs. So when we pass with our hands, we're passing with our legs. We need our legs to pass with our hands. Good job, Mate. Again, this is a way to create space. Watch the blowback and watch it go in between his legs. If he hits his knee, it'll change everything. And then on a ball that hits off the tape, we're going to have to put some force into it, but we don't want to break our wrist or our elbows. So we're going to use our shoulders or our legs 
to push. And we're using our platform as a guiding device. Boom. Look how quick he is with his left shoulder. And he has to be because he connects it in the midline. So there's a long way to go. But he's so quick with his left shoulder getting, catching the ball outside of his body and in front of his body to establish the platform in the angle. Fading in front of him. And he lets his arms go behind him. Watch one more. I like it. So again, it's tough, you know? Balls are always gonna move at the last second. Tape, float, spin. And so we wanna be conscious of all these different ways we can create space, because it's like a toolbox. And so this is why I really like making this day seven, because I'm refining my skill set as well, my toolbox, different ways to make space. Falling back, sacrificing, using the legs, in between the legs, maybe uh, I'm stepping back, or it's just like a hip just a little spot or a little twinge with the hip like Taylor does right here. Falls high, opens up the hips, able to keep the same angle, step back. Boom. Awesome. All right, I'll open it up for you guys. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, please write it down. I'm happy to, do, to answer, answer any questions you guys have. <laughs> Which one is Eric? A little too late for that one, but I think you probably figured it out. All right. Um, have you gone through any mental blocks in your career and how did you come out of it? Um, yeah, my whole career is full of mental blocks. This is, uh, this is sports and this is life. And so one thing that's really helped me a lot is uh, meditation. So meditation, it just it really helps you come back come back to being conscious because there's a lot of times where we're going to have all these thoughts, right? But we're not really conscious of the thoughts. The thoughts are just kind of going all throughout. And so I don't want to get too deep into meditation, but uh, with meditation, how I use it is I just focus on the breath coming in and out or the air coming in and out of my nose. And then once I catch myself thinking, which I'm going to be thinking a lot and I catch myself, I'm like, Oh, I caught myself thinking back to the breath. And so you can catch yourself in the game too, where maybe you're not passing well and you're like, oh, I caught myself thinking like, because a lot of times it's like we go downhill quickly, right? I'm not passing good. That's two balls in a row. Coach is going to pull me out. I'm not going to be a starter in the next game. Team's going to lose. I'm not going to be on a D1 team. My college coach is watching, you know? And once we're able to catch these thoughts, we realize that most of the time they're not serving us, right? And then, so we, then we are able to develop a new plan. All right, if these thoughts aren't serving you, what serves me? Maybe just breathe, maybe touch the hand of a teammate, maybe smile, maybe realize that I'll get the next ball. And so mindfulness has helped a lot, meditation. Journaling is great. Um, I want to, at the end of this, I want to gift you guys all a journal. I think Scotty has the information. Um, usually I sell a journal online, the one that I use every day. But uh, during this time, I really want to help younger athletes to, to start pushing in different areas because there's a lot of different ways where I push as a professional athlete that has nothing to do with anything physical or volleyballs. So journaling is huge, 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 huge. Um, starting with intention and purpose. What am I going to do today? What's in my control? What am I grateful for? And I think the thing that will help young athletes a lot, which has really helped me, at the end of the day, you have to find three things you did well. So even if you had the worst day ever, you have to find three things you did well. And then you realize, you know what? Yeah, maybe today was a tough day, but I'm still growing. Maybe it wasn't the biggest step I hoped to take, but it was a step and I'm growing. And then you can be honest with yourself, what was the biggest challenge? And then from there, maybe it was float surf. Today, I was just not great at float surfs. And so it's, what am I gonna do differently tomorrow? okay, I'm going to get in early and I'm going to work on flow surface reception. And so we're so quick with journaling to turn problems into solutions. And I think this is really powerful. We can do this every day, every second, every moment. You know, we're going to be sharper, we're going to be clear, and we're going to be more confident rather than letting these problems just always pollute us. So 
Uh, mindfulness, meditation, and journaling, I think, are the biggest ones. And assuming you guys are all into growing, I'll give you guys journals. I'll give you guys codes to get my job for free. Um, how to get a good pass for your hands when it is hit high. So we want to keep our legs as long as we can. And if the ball is really high and we're not able to move back, we want to be able to jump still in the air, but go as we're going up and then push fast. We don't want to be caught all the way up here because we're not going to be strong enough, right? So we want to keep our legs as long as we can. Uh, what made you want to keep doing volleyball when there's really – uh, hmm, tough things you have to work on uh, I think it's just always been fun for me like I'm so curious like uh, how much better I can be you know I love that just trying to be better every day and it's morphed from when I was younger is playing beach volleyball a lot uh, lifting getting extra reps and now it's watching video of great players uh, meditating, um, journaling, getting extra reps, but like really getting a lot of extra reps, working on my sleep, eating clean, juicing, not drinking soda. So there's a lot of different uh, edges I, I enjoy taking outside of the court that will in turn make me a better volleyball player, make me more prepared. Um, what made... Da, da, da. Good at home drills for serve receive. I don't think there really is much, you know. Uh, a lot of people were asking me this question. And uh, like I said, when I was young, I tried to play as much as I can at all the times possible. So I think the best thing you can do is if you have a brother, teach him or sister, teach him how to pepper. Go outside and pepper. But there really isn't a lot you can do to simulate uh, what you're doing in the gym. But what you can do is start visualizing. There's been a lot of uh, studies showing that um, just by visualizing, you can achieve the same, almost the same results as physically doing something. So there's a study of like uh, basketball players. Um, they had three groups, one that did nothing, one that practiced shooting free throws, one that visualized shooting free throws. And I think the visualized group shot free throws 90% as well as the people that actually were practicing. So visualization, start journaling, start uh, meditating, start stretching, start working on your, uh, your body and fitness. And the thing that's so powerful is these will benefit you short term, but hopefully they will turn into habits. And so when you go back on the court, you keep these habits because these are the things for me that are the most important. Doing these things doing these little things outside of the court. And so when you come back to the court, you're prepared. Like someone asked me earlier about uh, if I've had like any uh, ruts or mental uh, breaks. And yes, in the past I've had, but with uh, meditating and journaling, they are very rare now. So it's really interesting. Mm. As a libero, my coach wants me to take as much court as possible and so receive. At the pro level, is that as important or is it ideal to have a more balanced back row? Woo, good question. Um, so I forget if I have this in the email. So you'll see this on the, the seven-day passing course. I have the email. This is for free. I have another thing that isn't for free, but uh, I have uh, – if you look at my Instagram, you can kind of get a check of or feel of it. But we talk about footwork. And I use Sergio and myself as an example because both me and Sergio, we like to play a lot with the servers. And so there's different ways to take more court, but what I really like doing is baiting my receivers, right? A lot of times in the game, the coach is like, serve number five. And you know what? Number five is on my team, and I know the coach is saying this, and so I let number five be there, and at the last second, I move and take his court. And so I think this is a, a really – really good thing for younger athletes to start doing because not only will it expand your game, but college coaches are really going to notice it. If they see someone that's so aggressive and so confident doing this, they're like, yeah, of course I'll have this guy on my team. And so you can do this by using a crossover step. And so I talk more about this in the seven day course. And then also with the videos, I make it a lot easier. Actually, let me see. I'll show you guys real quick because I think this is a really good question. Um, but I think 
with regards to having a balanced attack, you want it balanced, but only if your passers are, uh, are confident. You don't want to do this if your passers aren't confident. So what I like to do in seams, right? If we have seams, it's left and right, but also front and back. So I'll let my passers always go in front, and if they're not confident and they don't go, I'm always going behind them to make sure I can get it for them. Let me share my screen. So let's see. So we can see a little bit, kind of like how I move. So you can see I have my passer in five. At the last second I move, and he's out, and I take everything. You can see this with Sergio too. He's a passer in five, he moves over, takes everything. I have a passer in one, guy tosses the ball, I move over, take everything. So this is good for a couple of reasons. One, I'm confident in myself that I can put the ball in the money. Now also my receiver can go hit his approach without any thought. Same thing, move over, I take the whole court. And then my guy can go hit the pick. Uh, let's see if I have one more. This one, it was at the end of the game, and uh, we were going to lose, and this guy shanked three balls in a row. I was just like, you know what, like, you're out. Like, and, like, trying to be compassionate, like, all right, he's struggling. Like, get out. I'll go get it. So, again, he tossed it. I told my opposite. I said, hey, come in and pass this ball. He tosses it. I step in. Boom. Pass the whole court. So there's a lot of different ways we can do this, but I think we have to be good with our footwork. And be as aggressive as you can if you're a libero. Uh, let's see. Um, do I use visualization before you play? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you guys want to go deeper into this, maybe we can set up a Zoom call with Scotty. And I can get my visualization coach because I actually work with a coach and we'll go through visualization before um, the games. He'll call me and or I'll call him and we'll run through a visualization. Who am I playing? What am I a little nervous about? What's my intentions? Do I want to be aggressive? Do I want to be patient? Do I want to be still? Do I want to be calm? And he runs me through visualization. So I, I know now he's starting to work with um, younger athletes. And so if you guys want, talk to Scotty and we can maybe set up a call. Um, uh, person that's asking about the journal, write me another question if I didn't address everything. How do I block personal negative thoughts on the court while playing journal and, uh, meditation? Mm -hmm. Really, it's, it's difficult to go deep into it. If you guys want, maybe we can set up another, um, uh, Zoom where we can talk more about mindfulness because this is something that's really, really, really powerful. But I think it's impossible to talk about this under like three minutes. <laughs> but a uh, short answer is um, journaling every day, which I'll give you as a journal. And then uh, starting to meditate. There's a couple different apps you can use. Headspace, Breathe, and 10% Happier. I personally used Headspace when I started. How do I deal with failure recovery in the moment? Uh, oof, again, mindfulness and uh, emphasis on the breath. So just coming back to the breath back to the breath, back to the breath. Because when we come back to the breath, we're not escaping the thoughts so much, but we're just moving our consciousness to here rather than just being lost in our thoughts. And again, we like spiral quickly, right? It's like, I passed a bad ball. I suck. I'm going to get pulled. I'm not going to be a starter anymore. The coach that's watching me is going to take me for college. I'm never going to play volleyball again. You know, these thoughts happen. I, I know it because I felt them as well. Only... It wasn't only until I started really pushing in mindfulness and meditation and journaling that I became much more clear in that like when bad things happen, I wouldn't get lost in my thoughts and just be like, okay, I didn't pass the ball well, but let's focus on the breath and let's get to the next play. And I think it's difficult for athletes because a lot of times the coaches say, get to the next ball. But as an athlete, you're like, how do I do this? You know? So um, since serve receive can be such a mental game, how – would you recommend for passers to kind of get past this mental block and move on? What has worked for you? Just coming back to the breath. And uh, the confidence that you get from preparing all week. And that is getting the extra reps, working hard in practice, having intention in practice, sleeping well, 
meditating, journaling, watching video. Watching video is the best thing you can do, especially during this time. Watch video, watch video, learn, 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 because your subconscious is so much more powerful than your conscious mind. So like process things a million times faster. And so subconsciously, when you watch video, you download the stuff. Your subconscious downloads it. It's like, uh, I give the example, when I was younger, I used to watch Kobe Bryant. And when I was younger, I didn't have a basketball coach, but I'd watch him. And the next morning, I would do fadeaways. No one ever taught me how to do a fadeaway. But the night before, I downloaded this information in my subconscious by watching Kobe. Younger players need to be watching great players. Unfortunately, we do not have a league in America, so it's really difficult to find this footage. Um, so best thing for me is focus on the breath. Do the preparation. The best way to prepare for me is watching video of great player passers. Really good questions. Um, have you ever struggled with working with another player getting along with your team? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when I go overseas because now everyone comes from a different background, a different way to train, a different way to play. Maybe it's like in Brazil where everyone just curses and yells. And I'm just like, whoa, like relax, you know? But again, going back to meditation, you realize that you have to, if you want love and compassion, you have to give it, right? You have to give what you want. And so even if someone's unbearable and just the worst and selfish and not a team player and thinks it's all about them, you know, probably they have some underlying stuff that they're dealing with, you know? Because someone that's really positive and happy and loving isn't going to do this stuff. So those people, we should probably be offering the most love and compassion. And if they're not accepted of it, accepting of it, then you should work outside of the court. Hey, maybe let's go get a pizza. Let's go get a coffee. Let's go to the movies and build that trust of them off the court. So when you step back on, you have that, that, that trust and they can bond with you. But yes, all the time I have this. Uh, do I use certain drills or techniques to improve passing with your hand setting? Fingertip push-ups, uh, I, like, I like using the med ball. The med ball is not realistic, but it makes you realize to push a med ball, you have to use your legs, right? And so you realize the importance of the legs when you pass with a med ball. So you use a med ball, a medicine ball. In the middle of the game, how do you deal with high pressure situations or how do you overcome having an off game or off day? Yeah, great question. I, uh, I like this. Uh, I have this sticky in my house, and it says, this is good because. And so after a tough game, tough performance, I'll ask myself, this is good because, and I'll find an answer. And again, it's just finding solutions, finding solutions rather than problems. You're not always going to play great. Your team isn't always going to win. So the big thing what will separate you between other players is how quick are you to find solutions rather than just focusing on the problem. Problem is, I didn't play well, coach didn't let me play, uh, team isn't playing well, my teammates aren't nice. Solutions is, okay, maybe I need to work a little bit harder. Maybe I can get some extra reps. Maybe I need to find uh, someone to learn from. Maybe I need to get a personal coach. Maybe I need to meditate more to be clear at the end of games. Find solutions, find solutions, find solutions. Everyone is gonna deal with problems, but we have to be quick dealing with these problems and finding solutions as fast as possible. During this quarantine time, where are some physical and mental drills you'd recommend for our volleyball daughters? Um, yeah, watching video. Uh, I can't say this enough. Uh, learning about volleyball, crafting your style, becoming more of a conscious creator in the style you play. Um, Let's see if I can put the chat up. If you go in the chat, I'll give you the, the website. Uh, I have the website where you can put in your email and then you'll get seven days of uh, pretty much of like my passing manifesto. I think this is good to read and whether you agree with it or not, there's a lot of good stuff in there that can make you think a little bit more. Uh, I'm not going to sell you it, but I do have a video course if you want to go deeper into that. Uh, but I think just trying to acquire as much knowledge and information that you can right now. And so when you go back on the court, it's clear what you want to do rather than just going on the court and being, when I pass, I want to put the ball 
to the setter and have an idea. Okay, when I pass, I need to prepare like this to put the ball at the setter. When I pass, I need to be balanced and athletic to be quick, move left or right. When I pass, I need to be conscious of creating space. When I pass, I need to be good with my footwork. These are the footworks I know how to use. And so just being so clear and conscious of your passing philosophy will make you a lot more confident when you step on the court. So right now, I've been doing a lot of work with my mental game. Meditating, again, journaling, but just watching tons of video and talking about it. When I talk about it, I become more assured in my philosophy. And so these sessions actually really help me with my volleyball. Uh, I was telling a group yesterday, when I started creating this um, manifesto, whatever you call it, it was at the end of our season, and it was the best I've ever passed. The, our league got cut short. I think like your guys is, our league got cut short. But the last game I played, it was just like perfect. I never played a better game in my life. And it was because all I was doing was just watching volleyball and learning about volleyball and writing my thoughts about volleyball. And so that was really powerful for me. And because I did this, I played the best I can. So right now, study volleyball. Create your own craft. Um, the email is free, so no strings attached. And you can be a co-creator. It's not me telling you, you have to do this. It's here's three things you can do in preparation. Here's four things you can do in a split step. Here's five ways you can create space. Here's four ways you can move. And so find different ways that you want to do and what resonates with how you want to play the game. Um, how do you practice service at home without equipment or people to help? you? receiving the mind uh yeah if you want to touch the ball there's things you can do but it's really not going to help you when you step on the court this is the time to invest in your mind and build habits so when you step back on the court you have these mental habits to continue it's it's like a diet right you don't want to do a diet where it's like okay for these four days i'm not going to eat junk i'm going to feel better and then you know it's not going to work like that create these habits now build this foundation so you're going to have uh, a benefit in the short term and in the long term. So create these habits, mindfulness, meditation, journaling, watching videos, stretching, eating right, not drinking soda, learning how to cook. These habits will stick with you for the rest of your life and they will continue to benefit you. Um, what is it like playing overseas? Good question. We could talk about this all day. Um, to be honest, it's very stressful. It's very lonely. Uh, sometimes it's depressing. <laughs> but you know what? Because all these things happen, all these bad things, you know, we're so quick to judge, uh, you learn the most about yourself. So it, it's great. You get to learn about different countries, different cultures, different people, different ways to pursue happiness. And I really like this. And even on these tough times, I learn the most about myself. And so it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating because you're alone, you're in a place where people do things completely different than you were taught how to do it. And you just have to figure it out on the go. And you have to be very productive with your time because you have a lot of time and it's very easy to be unproductive. It's very easy in the beginning of my career, play a lot of video games, uh, watch Netflix, got to sleep really late. And then I realized that these things are not serving myself. And so uh, recently I've been really good with my time and I really enjoy doing this, being productive and being disciplined. And you have to do this because you're by yourself. You don't have your family, you don't have your friends, your coach doesn't necessarily care about you because they're on a one-year contract. And so you have to be very uh, relentless in finding solutions, especially when things aren't going well. Uh, how often do I work out? What is the brief cover of your routine? Uh, usually the national team, three days a week, overseas, two days a week. I usually like to do some core yoga or stretching every day. How is my college experience different from an average student? Uh, very tiring. You know, you play a lot of volleyball, and when you're not playing volleyball, you are going to school, and then when you're not doing that, you try to have a social life, and so it's very exhausting. I did a really bad job time management-wise, um, but it was really fun. I think if you can be an athlete in college, go for it. It was an unbelievable experience. How should I bring back the fire to the team if we get to if we get down into a rut? What a great question. Um, I think you have to you have to lead it's just like a consistent exude consistent love and compassion for your teammates uh, in training when things are going well and when things aren't going well and, and just 
your teammates will feel this energy, right? It's all energy. And so it's like connect with them in a sincere way. Like, come on, man, we got this. Like, we got this. You got that. And celebrate their success more than you celebrate your own success. And when you do this, you give them confidence, right? They miss four balls in a row, but that fifth ball they get, and you push them, and it's like, yeah, you're the man. And they're like, yeah, I am the man, you know? This is the way I like to do it. And uh, I'm usually like the hype man as a libero. Uh, how to get good at footwork. Um, uh, this is where I would uh, say subscribe to the, to the newsletter because I talk three days about it. So almost like 3,000 words, I speak about footwork. So uh, read it there if you want to go deeper. I have the, the video presentation too, which uh, it shows it, kind of what I was showing you a little earlier. But um, there's the free content in the newsletter. And then also if you want to go deeper, you can pay for that on the video. Do I approach defensive moves differently than serve receive moves? Yeah, different time and place because we have to be in different positions to move. Maybe if it's, you know it's going to be a hard driven ball, we're going to be a little bit lower. If it's a ball where the block is closed, I'm going to be ready to move, so I'm going to be a little bit higher, but a little bit looser. Do I use the law of attraction? Yes and no. Uh, I need to learn more about it, but overall I think uh, I'll try to put out into the world what I want to receive back. And so just a lot of love, compassion, try to give a lot. What are your tips? That's really cool. If you're, if you're young and you're already thinking about that, that's awesome. What are your tips if you have all day games back to back nutrition? Uh, personally, I'm a vegan. I'm not going to push that on anyone else. It's your choice, but definitely eat plants. You know, um, it's so easy to snack today on food that really isn't food. You know, like Twizzlers, chips, candy. Like this stuff isn't food. Our body doesn't recognize this. There's a lot of vegan stuff like this too. That's more or less crap. And so you want to eat food as close as you can from its natural form. And so, you know, pack, I like packing smoothies. If you have a hydro flask, pack some smoothies. They'll keep it cold and fresh. That is the best way, I would say, to refuel throughout the day. Um, I've experimented with a lot of things. I just crush smoothies all day long. I feel great. I'm able to recover and refuel. Um, make some sandwiches, fresh fruit. Uh, make some date balls. You don't have to be vegan to love it. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can find like these energy balls where you mix dates, peanut butter, uh, maybe uh, some pumpkin seeds, goji berries, cacao. You can make really tasty like little uh, date balls. Uh, these are great as well, but eat whole food, drink lots of water. Don't touch soda ever. <laughs> uh, I haven't drank soda, I think, in maybe like 10 years. Um, don't touch it. It's just not doing anything good for your body. Uh, but invest in your health, learn more about food, um, eat food as close as you can to its original form. A lot of plants in, in my opinion. Um, do I ant anticipate or react more? Oh, good question. Uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, benefit coming to anticipating, but of course I react. What does the journal look like? What kind of stuff is on the inside? Okay. So there's two different sec sections in the journal itself. Um, Morning and evening. So morning, what am I grateful for? Three things you're grateful for. What's my intention today? Usually I use this for volleyball. Three things that are within my control. So three things that I can do, like no matter what. I can make my bed, I can meditate, eat a healthy lunch. Uh, I can do an exercise, get to practice early, uh, get to bed on time. Three things that are in your control. At the end of the day, we talk about three things that went well. Uh, I gave great energy. I came early to work hard. Um, I did all my homework, something like that. Um, excuse me. Thing that went tough today, I didn't dig well. Okay. Uh, what can I learn from it? I, I want to be more aggressive on defense. What can I do differently tomorrow? I want to go for every ball no matter how far it is, right? And then at the end, we talk about a 1 through 10 scale of how was I? Was I focused on the problem, one, or was I focused on the solution? And it's pretty amazing. Just by charting this, you become more solution-oriented. And then also in the journal, there's 21 um, articles on mindfulness and how they can apply to you in sport. And then also we have a, like kind of an introduction where I talk about journaling, my journaling, and why it's important to answer each question and how it will benefit you. Um, how do you get more confident in passing? Um, 
read uh, read my manifesto. I spent almost two months writing it, and uh, I think when you become more clear on how to pass, uh, how to be more sound technically, then you're just going to be a much more confident passer because you're going to understand what you need to do, and you're going to understand when you're not passing well, what's going wrong. And so, uh, of course, I'm a little biased because I wrote this, but I wish I had something like this when I was younger. Unbelievable. I think it's an unbelievable source of information. Uh, it's stuff I'm, that's necessary for me as a pro, for you as a young athlete. I think it's amazing. It's going to help anyone that reads it. And that's exactly why I created it. I want to give back volleyball to the community. So I think read, read this. And then when you are passing, when you're getting uh, reps before or after practice, hold your platform and you can teach yourself. How do you deal with players you notice are struggling in the middle of the game? Give them love and compassion. Treat them how you would want someone else to treat you. I'm sure there's times where you've struggled and something happened in the game where you've changed. Maybe it was a teammate saying, you got this or I believe in you. Something like that. And then just to the, be, that, be that person for someone else but give them support, give them confidence. Uh, what can you do when your coach tells you to get the ball, but your middle back player will not let you get the ball and you tell her that coach wants you to get the ball? I think you just go. You just go and then you can let the coach deal with it. Some coaches really motivate their players to be chirpy through the net to get in the opponent's head. What's your opinion on that? I used to talk a lot of uh, junk when I was younger, but I think the, the best way of being a great level player and winning is just doing your job. I think you should be vocal and communicate and celebrate, but once you start putting your energy on the other side, now you're losing energy. You're losing energy. You only have a certain amount of energy that you can put in the game. So once you start giving it to the other team, whether it's negative or positive, you're just taking away from yourself and you're taking away from your team. How do I buy the journal? Um, I think Scott will send out an email um, to everyone with the promo code. I'll, I'll put the, the site in the chat, the promo code STL for the journal. Uh, how do you come back from multiple injuries in the season? You just have to understand that this time will pass. Eventually the time will pass. and you have to be productive. Again, eating well, sleeping well, not watching Netflix all day, journaling, being clear. When I get back, how am I going to work? Because you're going to have to work a little harder, huh? So being clear of your intention. Uh, I'm thinking about switching clubs. Any tips? Mm, have good communication with the club you want to go to and have a good tryout. Uh, awesome. Awesome. So uh, fired up. Thank you guys for having me. Um, if you guys want, I'll put my Instagram name. If you guys want, you guys can write me questions there individually, follow me along. And like I said, I definitely suggest you uh, checking out my uh, seven day free passing course. It's free. <laughs> so I think especially during this time, it's good to, to learn as much as you can about passing technical and create your, Create your own style, right? Create your own style. When you do this, you're gonna become you're gonna become much more curious to continue learning rather than being uh, so vulnerable of the outcomes. And so, create your own style, how you want to play. I think I can help you with the email newsletter. If you want to go deeper, you'll see on the newsletter I have links for uh, the video courses. So I think this provides a big value too. But then again, uh, I'm a little biased. So. Thank you guys, and uh, if you guys have any questions, hit me up on Instagram. I'm happy to help any way I can. Coaches, you can reach me out too. Maybe we can do another Zoom on journaling. So thank you guys. Peace. Good night.